We are live. All right. Thank you all for being here. Um, thank you to Villa San Francisco and to Marguerite and um, LOD for organizing this uh, meeting. Um, just a quick introduction, uh, Villa San Francisco is a project of the cultural services of the French Embassy in the United States. Um, its aim is to experiment a uh, new format of artistic residency and engage international and local artists, as well as communities in a dialogue wide open on the future. So um, I'm spending uh, two weeks in this uh, wonderful um, apartment in Cold Valley, um, designed by, uh, the apartment is designed by Studio um, Montazavi, and I am, uh, I'm just gonna rotate a little bit. I am surrounded by just this beautiful environment and artworks by, um, Agnes Varda and um, or posters um, and Wayne Thibault and I have this amazing view of San Francisco here, which um, you know gives me a little bit of perspective um, as I reflect on the the pressing matters of our times, <laughs> which is uh, why I'm here, and. Um, some of these um, are the reason for this conversation. Um, the topics that um, we would like to talk um, about, me and uh, Michael, who um, will introduce himself in a, in a moment, um, such as sustainability um, as a way of living and also for us as, um, as artists, um, setting a, a better example for, for the world and how that fits inside our uh, consumerist times and um, something that is for me particularly important is um, how we can protect uh, nature by decrease deforestation and uh, the amount of, uh, of trash we produce. So um, just a few words about myself. Um, I'm Alexandra Chikorsky. Uh, I am a visual artist and I um, primarily work with uh, wood and oil painting. And in a second, I will share my screen. Just to um, give some visuals. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so as I said, I primarily work with uh, wood and um, I'm originally from uh, Romania. Um, I have lived in Germany for, for almost eight years and I um, relocated to the United States in 2011. Um, I create uh, artworks by recycling found materials, uh, mostly wood materials that I um, source from discarded furniture and um, local demolition sites or uh, construction sites. And I, I like to say that I paint with wood because I create these um, strips of wood out of the materials that I find. Um, and I, I see these strips of wood as my own uh, brush strokes that I paint with um, as I select them based on colors and textures. I don't, I don't color the wood itself, like all the differences in um, tones and shades that you see here are um, the natural um, colors of, of wood. Um, and with these strips of wood, I, I weave organic compositions um, based on my own um, personal experiences. So I kind of like to think that I, I create new narratives um, out of the stories that um, is inside already in these, um, these materials that I find. Um, the technique I use um, is derived from my interest of uh, building furniture, um, which started, uh, which evolved, I guess, when, uh, when I moved to the United States. So there is a lot of uh, 
meticulous cutting and gluing and fitting pieces together. This is a detail of an artwork um, where you can see there's uh, a thickness to the wood and um, there is a, a lot of cleaning up of the material involved and, and sanding and oiling to, to seal the surface, to protect it from the environment. Um, and I'll just share a, a brief, just a part of um, a video that's also on my website um, that shows my process. Um, the way I, I cut the pieces and I glue them and fit them together. And um, yeah, there is also a lot of planning involved. Um, it's not, a, I don't just start building and gluing and then to later realize that um, maybe the proportion wasn't right or something. So there's a lot of uh, sketching involved. Um, and pre-planning sometimes in a digital form as well to test things out. Um, and yeah, you can watch this, uh, the rest of this video as well on, um, on my uh, website. And in just a second, what I wanted to show is that when I, um, when I do the last stage of, uh, of this process with the oiling, uh, that's what uh, reveals the the natural colors of the of the material. So there's it just brings it back to life, sort of, um, and the contrast in the different uh, grains of wood. So uh, how do I stop sharing? You go. <laughs> and so um, this is uh, Michael Swank. I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, I'm Michael Swank. I am with the Proyectos Residencia and Proyectos Galleria um, in Mexico City. We're a residential and gallery exhibition program. And also, um, I am I'm an artist as well, uh, a graduate of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. In Chicago, uh, so many years ago, so many, many, many years ago, it's almost like I shouldn't, compl I shouldn't uh, claim that I graduated from there, like it should expire after so much time or something. Uh, but I work primarily with uh, the advertisement papers in the streets of Mexico City. So, um, in the culture here, much like uh, one of the few places I've been where I've seen this before too, is in, in, in France actually, in Paris, uh, in the metro system, uh, there's a old technique called decollage where you remove paper from the surface and uh, create new compositions from removing the paper. I saw this a lot in, uh, in uh, Paris actually. Um, actually this work up on my wall right here this painting up on the top up there is uh, part of the project from Paris, actually. Uh, but I take the paper and decollage on the walls on the streets of Mexico City. I document the process of doing that and create put, put photographic compositions. And then I remove the entire walls of paper and I bring them back into my studio um, and create uh, different murals and other compositions. And I've applied this to sculptural objects. Um, uh, as a more constructive process. Um, and also um, this series that you're seeing right here is from the transmutation series, which is a series um, about processing uh, personal uh, trauma of surviving the HIV AIDS epidemic in the 1980s and 90s. And then uh, two years ago, having tested positive for HIV, reliving the PTSD of that time and coming to terms with my own diagnosis and the changes of the uh, medications have made in my physical and emotional body as well. And so, and then these pieces right now are in the process of being reinstalled back out into the streets. I'm working quite a bit in the streets right now. That's my main uh, joy is working out into, in the streets. Um, and it's a little, uh, 
uh, awkward and interesting right now with the pandemic and nobody being in the streets because I'm used to working with lots of traffic around me and things. So I get very nervous when I'm out there and there's nobody there. So, but anyway, and, and Alexandra is also a resident of uh, our online virtual programming. Uh, we, when the pandemic started, much like uh, via San Francisco has changed to evolve, uh, we've evolved to, we have an online uh, residential program where we do some activities uh, a couple times a week, social activities, and uh, we work one-on-one uh, -on -one to um, create new opportunities and improve our presentations and um, uh, create collaborations and various different things. So Alexandra actually has a show with our gallery on artsy.net right now um, of your series, Small Gestures, um, which is, uh, not Small Gestures, I'm sorry, Self Portraits, which is one of my favorite uh, series of all your different pieces that you have uh, on your website right now. So um, very excited to have the opportunity to speak to you today about this concept of uh, recycled materials, where it comes from, and how it affects the aesthetics of your artwork and things. Um, we share a lot of commonalities in our work, which I think is one of the things that really attracted me to um, your portfolio when you applied here um, a little while ago. So, um, uh, Alexander, can you tell me um, how did you find uh, this program via San Francisco? And um, uh, what was the decision-making process about doing this? Because this seems like, from what I know of your work, this is a very different way for you to work. So I'm, I'm curious about uh, um, how you found it and uh, what you've been doing, your activities uh, during your residency, and uh, we'll dive in there. <laughs> um, I, uh, I became aware of this um, micro-residency program um, through other fellow artists um, who were also residents here. And um, I was really attracted to this um, idea of um, creating a, a dialogue with uh, the world on, on pressing matters because um, most of my, my work is very solitary. I, I just work in my studio in my, in my workshop. Um, and I reflect on a lot of things kind of on my own. And um, this, this, this is such an amazing opportunity to um, also experiment with uh, a new medium because um, I did not plan on bringing all my tools here to start cutting wood and <laughs> especially in this beautiful apartment. Um, that, that might that might push the apartment a little bit and and the neighbors <laughs> yeah um so it, it it was a fun challenge for me to think um of a project that um i would like to do here um which is a deviation from my typical work because um typically i deconstruct the materials that i, I find uh, and i repurpose them into my artwork and um this time I'm actually uh, fixing things. So before the um, residency started, I asked, um, I reached out to people and asked them to, uh, if they have any broken objects that they can um, no longer use, but still have, um, I, I would like to fix it for them. And during the, these two weeks, I am um, focusing on my own personal objects that um, I've selected a few, the ones that were more meaningful to me. And um, I am making a, a video project out of um, this process of uh, repairing. And the way I see it is, um, in my regular art practice, I make artwork um, out of these um, found materials that have their own stories. So it's a way to use many parts to create um, a whole. And in a similar way, I am taking um, the stories of um, my, my objects because there will be a voiceover with me telling the story about them. Um, and I am I'm weaving a, a story um, in a video format out of um, all of these objects. Um, and it, it's also a time for me to 
dedicate some time to a practice that's really meaningful for me that I um, also grew up around the, the practice of um, not discarding something that's broken, but um, repairing it or, or repurposing it if you can't repair it anymore. Um, and this is a practice that I think very often gets lost in the very fast pace of our reality. Um, so it's just a time for me to slow down and practice patience and um, reflect on how the material world um, has uh, an active part in our, our life and our um, personal stories. So, I mean, it's kind of interesting because you're flipping the script a little bit because usually you're seeking out uh, this, the materials, the wood that you're using in the compositions that we already saw. But in this instance, in the residency, you actually requested people to send broken objects to you. Did you give them any kind of like, um, uh, I don't want to say like barriers, but like, uh, I, I to, what's the word I'm looking for? I do this all the time. I get caught between English and Spanish coordinates. Uh, did you give them any, any guidelines? Yeah. Not really. Um, I actually even specified the fact that it doesn't have to be a very personal object from their grandma or something. Like it could just be um, a regular chair that has been used for a few years. And I, I asked people to send me a recording of um, them talking about the object, ways in, its, uh, in which it's been used, then for how long, maybe where it comes from, if that is known. Um, so very, it has a very sort of uh, anthropological aspect to it. How many pieces did you end up accepting from outside of like what you were working on yourself? Um, I think it's going to be uh, five. Initially there five, were more okay. and I just, uh, I started reducing them. Um, over like as the as the residency approached, um, I wanted to focus on the project that is my own objects, which is not one object being repaired and with a story told, but five of my objects um, woven in one narrative. So. Very interesting. I like the. I think it's really Alexander and I've had many conversations before, so I'm at a little bit of an advantage. So a, a little bit of background is, is that we've had this conversation in, um, in uh, various times about the concept of telling stories and how things, the, the narrative of the pieces come together. Because when I had originally seen them, I wasn't, I wasn't looking at, they're just such gorgeous objects. I was looking at the technical qualities of them the technical qualities of the materials and everything. And so at, when you first told me that you were recycling this wood, I was like, wow, that's, I mean, it's just, it's a gorgeous concept. Uh, when you consider the proliferation of materials that are available to artists on the marketplace itself to make the decision to use recycled materials is rooted somewhere. And I think you said that comes a lot from your childhood. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, your, where you're coming from childhood and how that ideal of recycling um, is sort of threaded through? Yeah, um, I, I grew up in Romania and um, in the 80s. So up until 89, Romania was under a communist regime. So there was a period of, I think almost 25 years um, during a lot of poverty developed and um, that kind of led to um, also community building and because of the necessity of the time people were um, very much inclined to uh, value all the objects the household objects they they had like if you had a, a table you know, dining table, it was likely from your parents or your grandparents, and you took really good care of that table because, you know, you didn't have the option to go to Ikea and just buy a new one. Oh. <laughs> and when things couldn't be repaired, they, um, people got really creative about like, well, like, what else can we do with this material? Or can the cable from this appliance be uh, kept for, you know, future use? Or you know maybe sometimes doing purely decorative things, um, 
out of objects. So there was a lot less um, trash and a lot less things being uh, thrown away. And that's just something that I grew up around. Um, and I still try to um, implement that um, in, in, my, in my life, not just my work. Yeah, and I mean, it's interesting because you're coming, we're kind of coming from Opta's perspective because I grew up in the United States um, where consumerism is king, uh, yes. you know, so so I, I was more used to that. And then uh, 10 or so years ago when I made the decision to leave the United States, uh, I had to, I sold everything off to get it down to three suitcases. And I, I think I had like a hundred plus pairs of shoes and like I could have worn a new outfit every day for a year, you know, like, I, you know, I had, I had consumerism down really well, but I, you know, I moved, when I moved to Mexico, um, the amount of variety of things um, diminished significantly. Like uh, just, you know, for example, like the cereal aisle, there's like, you know, one, one brand post or something and whatever post has, but if you go to, a, I, you go to a cereal aisle in a grocery store in the United States, it's like 70 different, you know, types of cereal or something. But I also became keenly aware that there were no thrift stores. There were, you know, that some of the things uh, that I would use to find objects for my own home weren't really there anymore. Um, and, uh, and that's sort of like my introduction to the concept of recycling. I was like, well, why can't I find a, a decent used sofa, you know, and everybody's like, well, because it goes to their family, it goes, you know, it carries on and everything. So I kind of became used to that uh, concept uh, as well. And, and sort of, you mentioned there's it. no storage places in Mexico either, right? Yeah, I don't see them. Um, I mean, there may be some around, but I certainly don't see them. Definitely. I'm more in the El Centro area. Um, maybe in the suburbs, there might be some more. But like in general, in the United States, everywhere you see self storage everywhere, all across everywhere, just everywhere. Even in San Francisco, when I lived in San Francisco, it was like there was a, you know, my apartment came with a storage space, you know, even so. Yeah, we don't, I mean, you just don't see that kind of accumulation. Uh, because things tend to get handed off to family members and things, but uh, but also that culture proliferates the expat community here. So most of the things that I have, furniture and things, have been uh, gifted to me through uh, you know people just cycling through Mexico City. Uh, it's a transient sort of uh, place too, for particularly for expats. So. Uh, very, it's very, uh, very interesting. Can you, can you uh, reference like uh, you were talking about the objects that you used that were personal? Um, what did you choose for as your personal objects, and how, um, how, how's the process of working with those objects? Uh, what's the significance of them? The objects that I'm um, working with at the residency here. Yeah, you said you made a distinction between having your own personal objects and then having uh, collected some from other people. I was curious about like what what the personal objects were and the significance. Um, there are things that um, some some things that I've had with me for many years, ever since I left Romania, such as something that my grandma crocheted and, you know, I think 15 years ago, um, I just decided like, oh, like I'm gonna finish this project and put it into a pillow because that's what she intended to do. Um, and all of these years have passed and I never found time to do a damn pillow. So. <laughs> but as I thought about my, my grandmother was such an important person in my life and in my childhood, um, I realized how much um, what a big story there is between this little piece of crochet that um, I want to turn into an object that I can keep using. Um, there's also a lamp that was broken, so it's it's not uh, they're not all deeply meaningful objects necessarily. But when I do reflect on okay, how long have I had them and why do I have it? Did I buy it did someone give it to me did someone forget it at the house when they moved uh, away um i realized like all these different objects um they actually connect with each other even though they come from they're, they're related to different people they're from different times of my life or locations they all 
kind of have a, a thread of, of narrative. Um, which... So these objects, in, in a sense, are sort of like, it's sort of like the how, how uh, music, if you hear a specific song, it re you can recall like smells and, you know, the environment and everything like that. Like these objects have memories of their own and, yes. and you're creating new memories, but also like protecting the old memories by doing these reparations with the, of them. Do you, do you don't have any of them with you right now, do you? Are they in the space or? Um, they are all here, <laughs> yes. Are you, are you, com are you comfortable oh, joining any of it? I know there's it's in one, process, so. There's one lamp in the, <laughs> um, they're, they're here. I'm still working on them. <laughs> I'm still fixing yeah. them. It, you're, it's you're, also such a wonderful practice because, you know, um, I, I try to maintain this this idea of like, I'm just going to repair, I'm going to do all these things that are, are important to me. And then I find myself being drawn in the same fast pace that we all have to kind of go with um, during this time. So I, I, I don't find time to always sew something or, but um, yeah, th this time has been so, it, it feels so rewarding to, dedicate this time towards uh, repairing these things and also um, making a, an art project and a video out of it. Yeah, I mean, I came to this more from the side of, uh, I mean, I, I used to, my process used to be very expensive because mm -hmm. of the way that I was doing it and the materials that I was using. And then um, uh, I, when I was, in, one, when I became unable to work, uh, because of health issues, uh, I had to evolve my process. And so uh, I started collecting the paper and using it because, well, it's recycled materials. I wasn't thinking like ethically about that or something like that. Uh, but I was thinking, wow, I have an unlimited amount of materials that I can use. Uh, mm -hmm. Because people throw so, you know, the paper is, is considered trash. And, you know, of course, in, like in the United States, people are always throwing away furniture and things without repairing them. So um, where are you sourcing your materials from? Are you, are you dumpster diving? Are you, um, what, what's going on? Are you, I just, I have this image of you, like, all dressed in black, running through the alleyways of San Francisco, like, oh, with a chair half broken. <laughs> like, oh, there goes another crackhead. Woo! <laughs> or an artist <laughs> yeah um i wouldn't say it's that aggressive but i do find myself in dumpsters sometimes particularly the um, the dumpsters from lumber yards where they you know they cut their wood and they they have plenty of things they throw away um because they can't sell those and that's a that's a can be a gold mine for me especially for hardwoods um Typically, I find things on the street. There's a lot of um, construction sites, like not necessarily demolition sites, although that can happen too, but people re, um, not redecorating, redoing a room in their house, right? So sometimes they have to tear a wall down. And uh, something that um, also probably the reason why I became interested in wood was when I moved to California, I noticed that all the houses were being built out of wood, um, which to me coming from Europe was very surprising to see this, see this skeleton of wood just rising really quick. And then there's some plywood and some other things and it's done like, wow. And so there's so much wood being used here. And, and every time, um, there is a change in the house. There is a lot of this wood that comes out and is being stocked up in a in a dumpster before it gets uh, thrown away. Uh, does the does the does that theme of sustainability of like pulling from those sources and things um, has that always been a part of your artwork? Like, uh, or is this something that came when you came to when you moved to California when you moved to the United States? It, it came out. Like, think, were you affected by the culture of the United States, the contrast yes, of your previous I, experience? I think it had to do, had a lot to do with um, being here and being in a, a more consumerist uh, environment than, 
the one I was used to because you know even Europe has its own tendencies like it's a it's a worldwide uh, natural evolution I suppose um, but uh, it it did develop here mostly because when I started noticing the kind of wood that was being uh, just tossed out in the street. Um, I realized that some of these pieces of wood were uh, from trees that were at least 400 years old at the time of cutting, which was already 100 years ago, because many of these houses were built in the 1920s, right? And just by cut, uh, counting the the rings and the, uh, what's it called? The, the wood, the wood green? Rings. Yeah. Yeah. I realized how much history there was in this material and also coming to appreciate the nature here which was new to me like the redwoods and the sequoias I, I just mm -hmm. such an amazing um, material to work with and do something out of it not throw away and there, there right. are also even in terms of quality they're better than anything you can possibly purchase in the lumber yard now where what is being sold is foreign. So it's, it's a very different material. So it's, it's very precious to me. And can you talk about the aesthetics of that material, like how it changes in your work and things? Because I, I mean, there's your work is displaying several different types of wood in there too. And then you're talking about different ages of wood. And I'm, I'm curious um, how that affects the aesthetics of what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so I think the, in my case, the aesthetic that one might typically uh, expect to see in an art made out of farm materials isn't um, as present because I, the, the wood that I find goes through a lot of um, cleanup, like I remove a lot of like plaster and rusted nails or varnish or, or paint, depending on whatever it is that I find. And it really doesn't take much uh, to get to the beauty of the wood and basically make it look like new. Um, right. And uh, which makes you wonder why they would even throw it away in the first place. But I, I guess exactly. you know, like it, it's so beautiful and it also it kind of it kind of also shows what what the world around us is made out of, like our urban surroundings, especially here with all the houses being built out of wood. So much of it comes from nature, like all the furniture, like it, really, if you look around you, there's so much wood that you can't see anymore because it's been so um, covered and modified and uh, we're, we're basically surrounded by nature all the time it just right we just we about. just we're it's it's shaped it's crafted into such a form that we would sometimes not even know um, I'm yeah. still disputing I'm still disputing whether IKEA is made from natural things or not so I'm, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not quite there but what do you can you speak a little bit to the responsibility of an artist and the concept of sustainability um, from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is, um, you know, as artists, we do have an important role to, to carry a message. And, you know, my art is not necessarily directly an activist art. Um, I, the, the artworks I make are based on my personal stories and emotions and, uh, they don't directly speak about sustainability, but the way in which I make my art um, does um, speak to that. And I think that is an important responsibility for all of us as artists to see how we can contribute to better practices. Like if we can use materials that are already there, great. If we can't, then maybe we can at least, you know, take really good care of our brushes so that we don't have to keep buying new ones, you know. 
Right. Or, or if we work with technology and we make performances, then we can at least look at how we can leave a smaller footprint wherever we are performing. Like, I, I understand that not all of us um, voice these messages uh, really aggressively. Like, I don't, maybe you can speak to your art as well, but I think it's also a very personal nature, but the way in which we do it um, is sustainable. And yeah, I think that's important for all of us to, to try and do. Yeah, and I mean, when I'm working in the streets, I, you know, I often get stopped by the police and the best way to explain what I'm doing is to tell them that I'm an artist and I'm recycling the materials and that I leave nothing behind. There's no trash. Um, which On the is, country. Right, which, which is probably, uh, like, is def definitely better than what it was was before I got there. So I've never, I knock on wood, I've never, I haven't gotten a ticket yet, but uh, <laughs> there's one coming, I know, just because we're talking about it. But for, yeah, for, I mean, for, for from me, my, it's a, for, my for perspective, me, it's, it's important that we be able to sustain the practice of making art as well. Yeah. So um, by using the these recycled materials um, that are available in abundance, um, I found that it places restrictions and creates opportunities. So the, like I have this, this pile of paper that I'm working with right here. Um, so these are, these could be, this is some paper from the streets uh, mm -hmm. that's I'm deconstructing right now. And then like, here's paper that's been painted on as well. And I, so I take these and I put them back out into the streets. So my, my sort of sustainability or my answer to like all these limitations, because this paper is disgusting. It takes a lot of work to get it um, cleaned and uh, purified in a way that uh, I it doesn't, know what it's like. Right. And it doesn't continue to decompose um, from, because this is, it's toilet paper. It's not, it's not meant for uh, archival uh, use or anything. So, so um, it, it's kind of a balance because I'm using a lot of varnishes and toxic materials um, to do this sort of activity. You know, it's mm -hmm. a form of like palimpsest or something. So, so. Um, I have a, I have a question because um, I could go to the lumber store any day and, and buy all the woods that um, I could possibly buy. And like, when I do go to lumber stores, I like drool over zebra woods, like wishing that someday <laughs> that I will find a piece of, if anyone out there has zebra wood, I would love to use it in my artwork, but I don't, um, I make a point of not buying anything unless it's absolutely necessary for a project. Like I need to build some frames and they all need to be the same and I don't have enough material that's the same. So, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious um, if you had an unlimited supply of brand new poster paper, would you find that as exciting um, and inspiring as the materials you find? Because I, I find like there's so much, um, the weight and kind of an energy that is in the material that I use and all the brand new one, like every new thing is, is exciting until you use it the first time and then like, ah, it's not that right. anymore. Yeah, I'm, I'm super ADHD. Um, I don't, uh, I rarely repeat the same thing completely the same way twice, but the thing about um, like I'm a terrible candidate for a nine to five job. Like the repetition drives me absolutely crazy. This quarantine drives me absolutely crazy. I have 10 months of being inside of my apartment. Absolutely insane. Uh, but uh, the process of removing that paper is the tactile process of it, the texture of it. And even like, you know, when I get done with a session, I'll, I have to, you know, tea tree oil my hands because there's so many scratches and things like that. I don't think I would change the process. Uh, I have printed some posters and then tried the same process because I saw some video on YouTube uh, for day collage. And I was like, oh, maybe I could do this with you, blah, 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 or, you know, something not nearly as exciting to me at all. Um, and also it kind of goes in the reverse. Then I end up using like inks and papers and, you know, and so I'm, I'm not really, I'm not really helping anything. I'm, 
I'm still contributing to the um, to the mess. But I mean, everything I use has been become recycled materials. Even these uh, smaller pieces. Um, these are this is wood re from the street. Um, this is wood from the street um, that it's mounted to. Um, I, I just I like the experience of going out to discover new materials. It's become so much a part of my process that I have um, like the quarantines have really been depressing for me because I can't spend the time that I want to uh, doing that. But also the paper isn't going up in the streets. If there's no cultural events happening, there is nothing happening in the streets. And so um, until recently, the paper started to come back a little bit more, but it's not cultural events. It's like advertising, you know, mm. um, it's, it's not even like interesting advertising. It's like, you know, house cleaning sprays and, uh, um, mocas, you know, like face masks and things. And you're just like, God, it's so boring. Um, but I mean, that process of being out in the streets is so important to the work. And I, I actually had started to lose momentum, um, in my work and the, last few months of the year. Um, and I think it was from not being out in the streets. And so I, you know, I had to go back out into the street. I took kind of my, a series of quarantine landscapes and I installed them back out into the streets uh, because it was like, it seemed like it was a full cycle of the materials that they should, you know, be taken from the streets and be returned to the streets. But it was also like, I, you know, if you can't go to a gallery, there's, there's a map on Google Maps that has like the location of those 10 pieces and you can tour around a neighborhood and like have an outdoor gallery experience. And, you know, I thought, well, maybe if it creates moments of meditation for people when they're trying to escape their family or, you know, like there's all these things about it. Um, but I, I don't think I would change it because the, just that process of, you know, like you, you're talking about like cleaning the woods and preparing the woods and things like that. There's something really precious about having to prepare those materials. It reminds me of like when I was in college and I did egg tempera and you had to like, you know, separate the egg and like, you know, blend the pigments and all that stuff. And it was all very precious and it required time and you really had to think and plan. That's what I like about it. It's like, it, it's like, it's, it's actually sort of deifying the materials. It's like, taking trash and turning it into, you know, an altar, you know, that's, I think that's an amazing thing. I see that a lot in your work. I'm just like, I can't even, like, I, I don't look at wood and think that's where it's going to come out. So that's one of the, one of the amazing things I love about your work. Um, it just, it, it, the, the whole ideal of it um, appeals to me. Um, and as a consumer, like a person who consumes things in the world and being aware of all these different uh, things that I consume and the packaging and all these things, I do feel like I'm contributing, you know, in some way to changing the mentality about uh, how materials uh, can be used for even, even with my own, you know, the peers in my own community and things, uh, and things too. So, um, uh, can, do you have a do you have any connection to France? Um, because this is the a, a residency with uh, French cultural uh, connections and things too. So, um, yes, I there is a connection there um, from my family. Um, I have a, a great uncle who, um, uh, after the uh, Second World War. Um, relocated or ran away to uh, France and, and married in Paris and had four kids. So as a result, I have um, about 12 cousins that um, I have only met one time uh, when I visited them with my family. And uh, my father also lived in Paris for a year. And, uh, you know, I grew up uh, or he, he had so many stories from Paris that like he really loved it there. And he hoped that he could move us all to Paris and we could all just um, live in this romantic, beautiful place. And, and he also stayed with my great, great uncle during that year. And um, there were some, some stories he came back with that were really interesting to me because my great uncle had this almost like an obsession for um, containers. Like he was unable to throw away any kind of, um, 
like tetra packs or um uh, or tin cans like he would just clean them up and store them and like fill the walls or rooms with them he wasn't able to throw them away and i think this comes from like war trauma because if you didn't have a container you couldn't receive your food and so hey. yeah uh that was a very touching story for me and also my my father is he is an artist himself um uh he started making all sorts of art projects with those containers, the ones that at least my great uncle could part with and started building furniture out of them and sculptures. So um, yeah, I guess that is my um, connection to, to France. I think, I, I think we should all just, let's all just, let's turn this off and let's all just move to Paris right now. Let's just, <laughs> let's just call it quits. <laughs> I love Paris. I, I've, I've only been to Paris one time. It sounds like I've been there a million times, but I had such an amazing, amazing experience there. And uh, the spirit of creativity that's in, in everything there is, is just uh, overwhelming. Love, love, love. Um, I think maybe we can look to see if there's any, um, or extend an invitation towards our audience, if anyone has any um, questions yeah there was one here from judith and she was asking about your practice uh, with the oils what oils do you use and is painting the wood panels first or painting them at the end um i i think and i think maybe our judith i think are you talking about the um the that the bright vibrant colors that are the wood pieces themselves or the background pieces can you answer both of those just in case I actually can't see that question, but uh, the oh okay. I think if she's referring to the um, the background colors, um, well, you 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 do color those uh, the longer strips that are sort of the vertical patterns, the linear line patterns too. I actually have a couple of artworks here, so oh I awesome, I can make it share like this so um the backgrounds are painted with um oil colors and that um that is a process that i do uh, after i have cut and glued all the wood um and sanded and oiled um and then there is another color in here uh, which is, this is a dyed maple vernier. So it's also wood. Um, it's, a, it's a similar, um, it's the kind of wood that is being used in skateboard uh, manufacturing. Um, so that, that's a type of plywood that I, um, I make and I do the strips out of it. Um, uh, so question from... Mushi, were there times um, that either you felt that even making art felt overwhelming because of your relationship to sustainability and waste, although you are using recycled material? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I have like, uh, I have like half a ton of paper in a loft stored above me right now. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit overwhelming. Uh, I don't know how I ended up with all this paper. It became sort of an addiction. I got really addicted, uh, when my health started to improve and I had the energy to go out into the streets for more than an hour, I started bringing all this paper back and then I had no idea what to do with it. And I swear to God, I think I moved this paper like a thousand times through, because every time a resident comes in, we shift spaces and create all these like, you know, unique spaces for people. So I'm always like moving all the materials and stuff around to do that. But it's like, I get so overwhelmed by the, the amount of paper and everything. And then, and then on the opposite, I got overwhelmed by the fact that nothing new was going up. Like I, I found myself starting to mourn during the quarantines like the loss of all that. And I was like, oh, well, thank God I have all this paper up here, but all that paper has all the images that I've been looking at for the last year. And so now I'm kind of, I'm all like tired of looking at them. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I get, I get very overwhelmed by the process of just trying to, 
it's like a library of paper library. I, I have a similar, um, I wouldn't necessarily call it, call it an issue, but it does become overwhelming sometimes because in the last years, every time I've moved, uh, I've made sure the garage has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger because that's my studio and wood shop. And the bigger right. the space, the more material I can uh, store. So there's just, uh, there's a lot of wood in my garage right now that is just waiting to be cleaned and, and stripped. And, and then there's also the pressure while I work, um, I also end up um, making trash, so to say. Like I cut pieces of wood and not everything gets used, right? So now I started collecting my own leftovers too, because I feel like I have the responsibility to at least try to make something out of that as well. So that's gonna probably be a very different kind of project where, you know, I um, there's smaller fragments, right? So that will dictate um, a different kind of aesthetic, uh, most likely. Yeah. I also I, I think also for myself, Alexandra, that the um, the fact that the paper comes from the streets, uh, I have, I would say that I felt a lot of pressure or um, I get overwhelmed sometimes by this concept that, it, you know, like the nat normal uh, linear progress of artwork is, you know, from the studio to the gallery to someone's home and uh, the paper seems to be telling me that it needs to go back out into the streets, which is very antithetical to my desire to be like an art mogul who survives off my million dollar, you know, commissions and things. So, um, so I mean, that, that could fall a little bit under the, the guise of, you know, feeling a little bit overwhelmed in the process of making art because the paper seems to, it seems to want to live on the streets. So I don't, I don't know. I haven't figured it completely out yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I mean the photographs the photographs are there which is great but like there's you know I mean the paper itself is so layered and textured and there's like all this sculptural uh, elements to it and so when you see a photo or like you look on a video you just see the flat plane but you know to see it in person it's like this multi-layered sculptural you know thick object um, too so so yeah I know I get I get a little I, you know, I think it's a, I think it's a part of uh, making artwork is like uh, negotiating that process uh, with the work. I do think that working with recycled materials uh, that don't come to you in purified forms and bottled and um, packaged for you, I do think that they come with a different kind of set of responsibilities, like the cleaning and, you know, and you have to understand the toxicity of all the materials that you're working with and how to stabilize those materials and and you know, and so there, there has to be a willingness, like yeah, uh, scientific or discovery. There's been some materials that I found as well, and I, I kind of decided to not recycle them because they were covered in so many old layers of paint, which uh, I'm sure had a lot of lead in them, and I just wasn't necessarily comfortable, or I, I didn't have the enough knowledge to know how to remove all of that in a safe way because if if I cut through uh, one of those pieces of wood covered in lead paint with one of like, like with a table saw I, I don't know what goes in the air and you know mm -hmm. what deposits itself on my shelves and um, so sometimes I have to make decisions like that too of okay maybe my health is at risk <laughs> Do you, you have good ventilation in your garage or? Uh, I uh, do my best. Yeah, I have I have a, like a large, uh, I don't know what it's called, like a, basically a, a giant vacuum cleaner that attaches to my table saw. But um, okay. I'm sure I could do better with all the sawdust that I'm inhaling. Yeah, you're making me think with the lead and everything that you're talking about too. I, I wanted to show this because somebody had asked a question about like uh, the scale of your work and how large you've gotten and stuff too. But I know that um, a few, I guess it was in the beginning of December, we had an art critique with the residency group and we were talking about this concept of scale because you have the small gestures pieces, which 
um, you can refer to those too, but you you go you do go larger, but you're also in the process of breaking out of the frames as well. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk a little bit about like how scale plays in your work and how large you go? We don't have a huge amount of time left, so. Um, yeah, I think I, I typically prefer larger formats. Um, by large, I mean, let's say 30 by 50, like nothing huge so far. Um, I think the smaller I get, um, it just really changes the dynamic in the composition because I don't want to cut the strips of wood uh, thinner than they are because then I lose a lot of the details in the in the wood grain. So I've kind of I've come to this uh, ideal width for me that's somewhere around one inch, one inch and a half up to two inches width. So as I've experimented with uh, smaller pieces, uh, like the ones where I go out of the frame, those are like 10 by 10 inches. Um, I found there was a there was a different there was a different kind of challenge because not everything didn't shrink. I still have the same width of strips. Um, so I think maybe that's why I started going outside of the frame because like it just I needed more room to show the the grain of, of wood, and right. and I I think just the material is, uh, material itself um, can allow for um, more experiments than what can happen inside a frame. So that's also something I want to develop in my um, uh, next body of um, work, which I'll start on after this residency. I could totally see an, a, an actual mural scale piece done with the, with this technique, although I can only imagine, I mean, you really have to, you'd really have to scavenge to, to work with the consistency and create a theme and things that, you know, tell the story that you're trying to tell with those materials. That's, I think that's the hardest part about recycled materials is, you know, because I get questions all the time about scale. Um, I don't like going larger because like, uh, like this piece behind me, the larger you go with the materials I use because of the way they install posters in the street, the images start to re uh, re repeat. So I had done this one whole wall mural, but then when I looked at it, it started to feel like I was looking at wallpaper because uh -huh. of the repetition of certain things. Yeah. So, um, so I, I get limited by some of those things because of the way I'm using those materials too. Um, I uh, it was, slow I, progress. It was, it was early last year that a friend of mine who's a, a contractor told me that ha he has a project where a house is being demolished and whether I was interested in any of the wood. And I was like, absolutely. So I went there with my boyfriend and we spent the day smashing the walls and tearing down plaster and loading the car full of um, all these strips of flat. And, and I know my boyfriend was asking, like, I really need all of this wood? <laughs> like, yes, like, um, who knows what mural I'll need to do? Like, this is the material that I don't, I can't go buy somewhere. I can't, like, whenever I find the opportunity, I need to take advantage of it and fill buckets of it at home and boxes and, yeah. Yeah, funny story about the, uh, that, I get that question all the time, because I, I don't have a car because um, where I live, uh, but and I and I'm not going to drive in Mexico, uh, but I'm always having to take Ubers. So it always takes like three or four Ubers who are willing before I get to one who's willing to let me put the paper into the car. Um, but like in one particular instance, I was taking down. Um, I had this plan to take down this like four foot section, um, six foot tall part. And I've been working that way. And then the police came over and started talking to me. We had this whole conversation about recycling. And then uh, he left and I was like, whoosh, you know, avoided. And then all of a sudden, all these like trucks like pulled up behind me on the street. And this is on, uh, this is on uh, Insurgentes, one of the major avenues in the, in the city. And it was the uh, Department of Waste. And I thought, oh God, I'm in trouble. Like something's gonna happen. And, and basically they came to help me. And so I ended up taking about 40 feet long full of wall down that was like you know a good two two feet thick 
a, a paper and then I had to get it all home. <laughs> and I was like calling people with, that I knew who had trust and stuff. I was like, can you please help me? I'm stuck on Insurgentes with all this recycled material. <laughs> I can't leave it here. Problems you have. <laughs> right, yeah, so it's like an abundance, you know, you get sometimes when you see those opportunities, you just really have to take advantage of it because you really don't know. You don't um, know, yeah. Yeah, so we're getting a, a message. We're at our one hour live. I don't, it, can we go over a few minutes? I wanted to see, if, I wanted to ask if anybody else had any questions or anything too. Yeah, we can go over a few minutes. So um, anybody in the audience have questions? There is a Q&A um, button on the bottom of the Zoom screen. So you can uh, click on that and type in your questions if you have any. Um, Oh, By the way, I, I ended up extending my recycled materials to using um, recycled house paints and stuff with my work, um, too, because I usually I work with Cinelier oil pastels, which, um, you know, these are Cinelier and they're it's just like this gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous pigment and they're like butter. I mean, these things, this is like these are, these are over everything, right? Oh, oh my God. They get, and they get into your clothes and then everything else. And I love them so much. And I used to use these like all exclusively, but the problem was the cost and you can't get them in Mexico. So uh, I have this underground railroad where I like have people carrying them in and stuff like that, but it became too expensive. They're like 15 to $20 a stick. So um, I started using the ha recycled house paints to put like the base color down. And then I go over with the Cinelier to give the, the less quality that um, that oils do. It doesn't mm. look like we have any other questions coming David through. David has a question. What's the largest piece you have made with the wood layering? What's the smallest piece? Um, I think they're both probably the the two most recent pieces I've made. Um, one that um, I'm still framing, so I don't have an image of it yet. Um, I think it's probably about close to 40 by 60 inches. Um, so it's not huge. Uh, I, I try to, I think, I, yeah, I try to make pieces that uh, I know I can transport with my own car. At least that's my limitation um, so far. Um, and it's also a consideration to weight. Um, if I end up making much larger pieces, then I'll have to use a much thicker backing and mm -hmm. all the pieces will be very heavy then. Right now, they're not, they're not that heavy. They're not as heavy as they maybe look or you would think when you see wood. And the smallest piece um, is, uh, there's two pieces I made and are, are currently at the Voss Gallery in um, San Francisco. They're both uh, 10 by 10 inches. So uh, that, that was the requirement for the exhibit and that was uh it was fun and it was also challenging because i had never made something so so small so i felt really in a way restricted and that's probably why i went outside of the shape too i'm like oh, i was gonna cheat a little bit here <laughs> <laughs> but i really you know that led to some ideas that i want to develop further so uh, I, I i've always found in artwork um, I was a college teacher for many years too. It's the restrictions. It's the box that you work within that creates the creativity for myself. And yeah. I found that to be true with students and other artists uh, as well. It's just like, if you have everything available to you, um, it can be overwhelming and you have no, you can have nowhere, no yeah. idea where to start. But when you have these materials, it's like these materials, they talk to you. They tell you things about themselves. They, you know, they dictate the direction that you go in. You, you know, you can't. Yeah, they, they're inspiring. They're like also a, a form of constraint, right? Because you don't right. know what you're gonna get. So that, that's also helpful, I find. Yeah, and I think that uh, that's a that's an indication, in my mind. You know, when somebody asks me, like, you know, what is an artist? I always, I'm like, an artist is curious. An artist is has resilience and an artist is flexible, <laughs> you know, and our, you know, we, we adapt, we find new ways to create. It's a, it's a compulsion. So, yeah, I mean, even like, you know, like, I mean, so talk about like sustainability. I mean, like, uh, this is, uh, this is a terrible, oh. uh, Kathy Kollowitz, like in, uh, she was in a concentration camp 
and she would take the, when she put the fur jackets on the Nazi officer's wife, she would take a little hair out of it, and then she would scrape rust from the jail cell bars and make her pigment and then put together a brush and do her pieces with that. And I'm like, that to me, that's an artist. I mean, you got it all. You got sustainability, you got recycling, you got, you know, survival. I mean, you got the story, everything. It's, yeah. So I appreciate you uh, talking about this uh, tonight and inviting me to talk with you. Um, Likewise. Thank you so much little, for joining me. Um, how do we how do we see the outcomes of your residency projects? Like, how long do you think it will take? And then, like, where we, where do we look for the outcomes? So my um, my uh, residency ends uh, at the end of next week, um, and hopefully around that time I will have um, all the videos ready, and I will have them on my website. Um, so I will share them. Um, on all the channels or of social media and post them on my website. Yeah, and it's always like, is Instagram like the most current pieces that you're working on? And do you put like things like your process and stuff in stories or like, are there other things that we can find out about you that are specific to social media? It's such, social media is so easy. That's why I asked the question. I, I'm working on that. Yes, <laughs> I'm working on that. <laughs> You're like, not that easy. Not that easy, Michael. Don't put pressure on me. <laughs> and uh, I believe the Villa San Francisco, um, as they commented here, will um, will also be uh, sharing the the work that I will be making here. So stay tuned. Yes. Yeah. On your website. Yeah, and and uh, my website is completely out of date. Um, <laughs> so Instagram is always the best place to see what's going on. Uh, for me, the, the queer alchemist on Instagram is my is my Instagram and I'm always updating things. You could see like the 10 landscapes that I put out into the um, streets and four of them had been stolen already, um, thwarting my efforts, um, but also creating opportunities for, for uh, creativity. So. Um, Anyway, I thank you so much, Alexandra. I love having you in the residency. I'm, I've enjoyed getting to know your work. I encourage everyone to get to know um, Alexandra's work more and uh, very excited to have been invited by Villa um, San Francisco. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Hasta luego.